Um, welcome to room one. We are going to start with uh, Camila Petrelli Giuliano, who is originally from Brazil and during currently her PhD in a startup in Paris, in France. She's studying the origins of life using microfluids. Uh, please put all your questions into the chat because afterwards we're going to answer all these questions in one question and answers round. Thank you, Camila, you are on stage. Great, so thank you very much for the invitation to share a little bit of my story. Um, I'll do a very brief presentation of my uh, trajectory until now, so please feel free to ask questions if something is not clear. But basically, I want to tell you how the origins of life met microfluidics inside their startup and what that has to do with me. Um, so I'm a biotech engineer from Brazil. Originally, I did my bachelor's at UNESP uh, in Sao Paulo. And during my bachelor, I had the opportunity to do plenty of uh, exchange programs and to try a lot of different things. So I went to the US uh, with the Science Without Borders program that the Brazilians will recognize. There I did a, an internship at Harvard with carnivorous plants and published my first paper. After that, I came to Europe with Erasmus Mundus uh, to study at uh, the University of Groningen and did an internship at Philips. Uh, and that's where I started to feel like that I had a more inclination towards business than science. Uh, and that's why when I graduated in 2015, I decided to leave academia for good and start working in, in the uh, technological market, let's say. So I started a, a internship, a traineeship at IBM. But then I realized that the life in the big companies was also not for me. <laughs> and that's how I ended up going to a startup accelerator in 2016 to work helping very small businesses giving, uh, to, to give their first steps. And I absolutely loved it. Uh, and I stayed there for a few years, but working with such bright people with such interesting entrepreneurs made me feel that I was not using my technical background well, and I could actually do more with the science background that I had. So I decided I wanted to get back to science somehow and sort of be in the interface between science and business. And that's how I decided to do a master's that was sort of like an MBA in the life science sector. So I went to the University of Cambridge in 2018 to do this master's, it's called uh, Master's in Bioscience Enterprises. And there I saw that actually, yes, I want to be in this interface. I want to be in science because I find it extremely thrilling to, to have new discoveries and to be at the edge of innovation. But I want this innovation to be used for something. And that's how I start thinking about my next stage, uh, my next step in, in my career. And when I found an opportunity at Elvisys to do a PhD inside a startup company, I thought it was like, that's the perfect match. That's exactly what I was looking for because uh, I, I don't actually have the profile to work in a big company. And I want to be involved with science, but I wouldn't fit an academic lab as well. So the opportunity that I have with the H2020 program inside a small startup was the perfect match and that's how I ended up here. And I've been here since the end of 2019. Uh, and what I'm doing here basically. So I, my, my PhD project has actually two projects inside one. One has a more scientific uh, approach that is uh, to study compartmentalization. So when we talk about the origins of life, we see compartments like the cells as the basic unit of life. And one of the, the approaches is to try to understand how the, the first compartments came to be in that soup that we imagine the, the origins of life took place. And I'm using microfluidics that is basically using fluids in a very, very, very small scale to try to replica, replicate how these first compartments came to be. And that's a collaboration between Elvis's ETH Zurich and the Max Planck Institute in Germany. Uh, so that's a more scientific based project of my PhD, but I also have a more 
applied project that is the product development of a pH control platform using microfluidics as well. It's more like a tool that, I, that could be eventually commercialized in, in the future. So I think I'm getting the best of both worlds. So I, I'm doing a lot of research at the moment, but actually I will be focusing on developing a product that can actually get to the catalog of the startup by the end of my, of my tenure here. And just to show you guys a little bit of, uh, of the results I got so far. So I didn't even uh, didn't start the second project yet. So it's very preliminary, but the first one I'm almost finishing. So you can see here uh, the production of, of some compartments using microfluidics. This is a microfluidic channel that is 200 microns wide. And here we have double emotions that are basically water droplets inside oil droplets inside water. And uh, so the pink part is the oil, and you can see them being produced and, and just flowing down the, the chip. Uh, they're about 50 microns in, in size. And during also the, the confinement and all the pandemic, uh, I also managed to get the, my first publication out. So it's a review on compartments as well. Uh, so I'm really glad to be getting to the end of this first project and starting the new one soon. Uh, so basically, that's it for me. Uh, if you have any questions, I'll be very happy to answer. Camila, thank you very much. This was a very interesting and very challenging life, obviously, so far. <laughs> um, let's go to the next presentation. We will leave all the questions for the end. Uh, Sophia is going to uh, is going to talk um about her phd in in europe she's a chemical engineer from argentina and she's a phd researcher at the european training network charming conducting research in the chemical industry in germany so sophia please thank you um thank you all i'm sophia garcia Fracaro. as i mentioned and i'm doing conducting and conducting research in germany and I will focus this presentation more on the aspect on the administrative side on how is my experience, how I got this opportunity and what is an industrial PhD uh, like here in, in Europe. My recruitment process started in the year 2018. So in the websites that haven't been already shared, uh, you can search by topic or country that you want to do your research in and here I found my project. This it was a start. It started with 15 ESR positions. ESR is early stage researcher. So um, I applied in by October of the 2018 to apply to this position. Um, I have created a Europass CV that you also will have find the link here. This is a standard CV model that we use here in Europe. A motivation letter, transcripts from bachelor and master's degree. Uh, a special note for Argentinian candidates when in, U in Argentina some of the degrees are five years long in Europe the bachelor is three years and the master is another is two years so um, I will encourage you to ask the recruitment officers from the project that you like if your bachelor degree from Argentina could count uh, as a still master and you can still apply and um, you also I also submitted a language uh, proficiency certificate and I was asked to choose first, second, and third option from the, all the positions that I like from the project. Then I got pre-selected, and in um, more or less a month time, there was a recruitment event in Belgium. And by this time, I was doing my master's in US, so I couldn't travel. But they allowed me to present and do the interview online. And for this, I have a pre-meeting with my future supervisor, he told me what were the questions that I should answer in a video. I prepared a video, I think it was 10 minutes long. I submitted and then they watch it in the, in the event. Almost half of the participants that were pre-selected did an online video. So if you are, the, you know, please, if you are from Argentina and you think, oh, I won't be able to attend an interview in Belgium in a month, uh, don't worry that the countries um, allow international participants to do video interviews. Then I got recruited, I got my contract, went to the embassy and got my visa. And one important point is that um, my 
the deadline was to start in April and I was finishing by May of the year following year. And I still applied and I still answer the question saying that I will be available in a month. So then they were fine with it. So please don't stop applying because you, you don't match all the requirements. Just ask the question and they could be flexible about this. And you will also find in these websites that um, sometimes they search for 15 ESRs and sometimes they search for one or two positions. This is because in the first call it was not all, everything was filled and they still have some positions to complete. Um, you have here a lot of information about the European training networks. So some, some details about mine. We are 15 researchers and we are in all these locations in Europe. And the most important thing is this is an interdisciplinary collaboration. We are, in, we are located in industry and in universities. And we meet twice a year in a network-wide event where we share our results and we have a special trainings for skills and science and technology. And we also have the comments where we are, we have to go to um, other institutions. For example, I'm in a company, so I have to go to the university um, to have some, some training there. And we also have funding for conferences, summer schools, language course, basically any training that you would like to have, uh, you can do it. And finally, um, my industrial PhD, what does it mean? It means that I'm working in a company. I'm an employee of a chemical company in Germany. I attend every day as work, well, now from home. Uh, I have access to the data and as resources from the company. And I have the possibility to test my prototypes within, within the company, which is a great, a great benefit. But I also, because the company cannot provide me with my PhD degree, I also run in a university, in this case, in my university is from Belgium, from is KU Leuven, where I have to follow all the requirements um, to, to obtain my degree. So number of publications, participation in conferences, mandatory trainings and courses. Um, I have to do both things at the same time, uh, but it's great. So this is all for now. And um, you will have all my information if you have any other question. Uh, we have questions now, but if you have any other questions that you want to follow up, please email me or contact me on LinkedIn. Thank you. Sophia, thank you very much. Thank you very much also for staying so nicely in time. <laughs> this is really great. Um, so uh, I will, I will of course, we, we, got, we got some questions actually in the chat, but I, I will start out with one question actually, which goes to both of you, Camila and at you, Sophia. Um, obviously it takes a while from the first point a time when you choose to do for, uh, go for a position until you finally end up going somewhere. It, in your case, it seems to be like 10 months or something like this, is everything goes straight. So in principle, when do, would you recommend people to start looking for positions? And when would you recommend people to start uh, to really trying to, f to find the funding? Maybe we start with Camilla because she... Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I'm not entirely sure if in my case, I was lucky because my process was very fast. I applied late, or early April, and I, I got the answer by May. But uh, it's always like, um, as Sophia said, in my case, there was only one uh, position left. So I think they had already filled up the other positions before. And, and then I started in October, but that was my choice. So I think I'm not in the, I'm also in the university and, that, and it helps to, to be within the university time frames. So for example, here things start in September. So if you apply around April, if we start searching things around April, maybe by September you have everything set to start and your life is easier with the university. But in the case of the startup, they have a lot of flexibility. So for them, it didn't matter that much when I started. Um, but maybe thinking about the time frames of the of the universities can help a lot. Sophia. Yes, in my case, um, I was I knew that I wanted a PhD position in this topic in Europe, so I was constant, constantly checking uh, the website because 
as you know, um, it refresh every time. It's not that um, sometimes the positions are open because it, it wasn't open uh, for the past six months and now the, uh, there is a new position. So I, I recommend that constantly or not constantly every day, but often check the website because um, several opportunities are new uh, appearing there. Um, I started looking, so I knew that I was going to need a new job by May um, in one year. Um, and I started looking at it in the previous May. So um, it was this looking, finding the position and they I applied by October. So it is always um, a, a gap of time that you need to allow time to also to get the visa, also to, to go through the selection process. But I will say I started a year before. Okay, thank you so much. Another question that came up, which is actually quite interesting to see is, uh, did you have to request admission into a graduate program to do your PhD or was it like included with, um, I, I guess the grant came when you were uh, with, with the position, so you didn't have to apply for the Marie Curie grant, but did you have to apply to the post-graduation school to get admitted or was this included already? Um, I can uh, reply this. So originally, in my case, I was going to be enrolled in, in Newcastle University in England, which is also part of our consortium. And there was a problem um, with uh, administrative problems. So I ended up being enrolled in KU Leuven. This was after I started. So I started on the 1st of May. And then I end up being enrolled by September. So there was a, a gap of time that I was um, a researcher, but uh, without university. Because this, I was in, in the company working. Um, I had to submit, I have to go to KU Leuven and present all my degrees, um, all my certificates. And it was a special case for me, maybe, my, maybe it's relevant because I was from Argentina my undergrad was from Argentina, my master was from US, but I still had, I was enrolled as pre-candidate for doctoral school. This means that I had to do two extra courses in order to become a PhD student. Um, this might be relevant for, for any other Argentinian participant applying in Belgium. So they have this rule that if you are from Belgium, you are automatically enrolled. And if you are from outside Europe, you have this extra two classes that you have to do. Um, but yes, I had to be enrolled. Um, did you have to validate your university diplomas from Argentina to, in order to be able to enroll? Uh, no, um, I have everything translated to English and they didn't ask me to validate anything. Um, Thank you. Camila. Yeah, for me it was similar. I need to, to be enrolled as well, but I wouldn't say there was a selection process. It was more like an administrative, uh, administrative process, like just almost formality, because I do have my own supervisor. I'm in the University of Strasbourg here in France, and I have my own supervisor there, so I already had his okay, and it was more like just filling out papers. It took some time, so I had a, a similar uh, situation where I started in October and I was only enrolled in January. So I was a few months also without university. Um, I didn't have to, I had to sort of uh, validate my master's degree from, from England, but was just, it was literally just sending a, a letter like explaining what I have done and that was equivalent and blah, blah, blah. And it was literally just bureaucracy was nothing uh, it just took time because a lot of papers but nothing special okay i see we do not have any further questions right now so well probably they will come up over the next time and surely we will get back to you guys camilla sofia thank you very much thank you very much for sharing your experiences and i hope to see you soon on another event and thank you to uh, all to the participants. Please feel free to send questions. Worst case, send it to your access. If you don't know anyone else to send it to, they will forward it to us.